We're going to address some of this this morning. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices, which they offer year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be an offer? Because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore when he cometh into the world he saith sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not but a body hast thou prepared me in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin. Thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written to me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second, by which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, once and for all. Father, we thank you, dear God, this morning for the gift. Thank you, dear God, for the church here. We pray, Father, over these scriptures this morning, Lord, that you let them say what they say. Lord, you'd guard our tongue. We wouldn't say anything that wouldn't be pleasing to you today. And we pray, Father, we take them to heart and we realize just who it is that the Lord Jesus Christ is to us today. We honor him, we praise him in his name. And amen. amen. The 10th chapter of the Hebrews, it talks about a perfect sacrifice. And I want to talk about that this morning. And notice it says perfect. Perfect. You look down there in, in verse 14, and notice what it says there. For by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. That word perfect is used over and over in the book of Hebrews. And it's used over and over to express a, not only a perfect sacrifice, but a, a perfect salvation. Uh, that's what I want to talk to you this morning about about a perfect salvation. I believe that it's the most important thing in a person's life. Now, I'm not taking away from relationships, certainly not taking away from obligations. We know all those things are important. And the way that we handle our relationships in this world, uh, uh, our interaction with our fellow man, uh, the things that we say, the things that we do, the way that we act around them, uh, and the image that we project in front of them is certainly important today. And so is our obligations, fulfilling our obligations, the things that we should do. And listen, we ought to do those things. And it's, there's an importance in that because the people that we interact with that, with, with, with those things in our relationships and our obligations, the people who watch the way that we handle those things, they're either going to look at us and say, there is a man of God, there is a woman of God, and there, Brother Lonnie, goes a amen. Christian, amen, or they're going to say, there goes a hypocrite. So those things are important, and I'm not taken away from them, but I believe over and above that, I believe salvation is the most important thing in a person's life. Yeah. And, and when salvation comes to you, and, and you are a new creature in Christ Jesus, and, and you are living a new life, you've got a new spirit in you, and you look at things differently, then I believe that uh, you're going to handle those relationships and those obligations according to the Word of God, and, and they're going to be uh, just fine. Amen. That's why I think that uh, salvation is over and above all those things. And we know that, uh, that as we look at our life and we look at our walk with the Lord and we look at these things, all these obligations and the relationships, one day those are going to come to an end. Amen. Oh, that's going to stop. 
And there'll be no more of that. I, I think about what Brother James says, or the Apostle James, I call him Brother James, over in his epistle in chapter 4, verse 14, he asks a question there. He says, for what is your life? And he asked that in a certain context, Brother Roger. And he asked it in the context that he says, you know not what shall be on the morrow. In other words, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Now, those people that went in those towers, they didn't know what was about to happen to them. Amen. And it's the same way in our life. We don't know what the tomorrow bring. One day can make such a big difference in your life. It can be life changing. We don't know what the next day holds. Uh, we don't know what it'll be like tomorrow. Uh, I thought we might eat and drink and be merry today and tomorrow. We may have some of what Job had put on him. We don't know. We don't know. You may wake up. I was thinking about my sister. Uh, there she was, a blood clot in each lung. I was thinking about Ralph Carroll having that stroke. Listen, uh, you may wake up in the, uh, the next time you open your eyes, and uh, you may open them up and find yourself with one of those blood clots blocking the flow of blood to your vein, to your brain, and, and you find that you can't speak, or perhaps you can't move your body. Uh, we don't know what the next day will bring. That's why uh, James says that we should not boast uh, of tomorrow. Not to boast in ourselves of tomorrow, we shouldn't do that. And he answers the question. The question was, for what is your life? And he says, it's even as a vapor which appeared for a little while, then vanishes away. It's kind of like standing on top of a mountain, somewhere in an overlook. And looking down in these hollers and seeing the fog laying down in there. And the sun gets on, and it's not long till that fog is gone. That's why our life is. It vanishes away when it comes here to stay. I was thinking about death. Death backs 100%. And you can say, well, it got out of here, and so did Elijah. That's the only two exceptions I see. Everyone else is going by the way of the grave. They're going to die. It's back 100%. The Almighty told Adam, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And because of Adam's disobedience, because Adam was disobedient unto the Lord, and his eyes was open, that he could know both good and evil. And man has chosen evil from that time on. The Bible says, for all have sinned, there's another 100%. It didn't leave anybody out. All have sinned. And since the wages of sin is death, we have an appointment coming to us. And that appointment is certainly death. It says there in Hebrews, you back up in chapter 9, verse 27, and it says, As this is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Amen. Let's listen to the radio back when we lived the drive three weeks it was. I was in the basement in there every day doing what I did down there to, uh, to make a little money, you know. And, and I always listened to preaching on the radio. And I heard this preacher come on there, and he began to talk about a chief of police he knew. He knew this chief of police in his hometown, Brother Lonnie, and he said that man didn't fear anything. And he said, if you had broken the law and he'd come after you, it didn't matter what the circumstance was, it didn't matter what the danger was, he was coming to get you because he did not fear injury and he did not fear death. Well, his time rolled around, his appointment, just like everybody else. And he was laying on his deathbed. And he said that his wife had called him. And he called him and said, could you come and talk to my husband? I'm worried about his soul. He said, I'd be glad to do that. Be right over there. So he goes over. He says he walks in the room. Says, uh, that, old, that old cop is laying there on his uh, bed. And said, uh, he looks at him and, and introduces himself to have a conversation. And said, when they get finished there with a little small talk, he asked him, he said, are you troubled? And the cop said, about what? He said, well, do you understand you're about to die? That you're not going to be here very long. He said, that guy looked at him and said, yeah, I understand that. I know that my hours are few. I know it's not going to be long because I'm going to die. But I have never, ever feared death. And I got no fear in me about to die. He said, that's not what I'm asking you to trouble about. He said, the Bible says it's appointed unto man and the men wants to die. But after this, the judgment. He said that old man opened up his eyes real wide and looked at him and said, my God, I never thought about that. See, it's coming. It's coming to everybody. 
It certainly is. There's going to be a judgment one day after a while. And, and I think about the judgment. When you look in the Bible, uh, there's two judgments mentioned. One is the judgment seat of Christ, where the redeemed will stand and will be judged for the works that we did here upon this earth. We'll be rewarded, or rewards will be taken away, whatever will be the case, as those are judged. The second judgment that you find in the Bible is the great white throne judgment and it's mentioned in Revelation chapter 20 and I believe it begins in verse 11. Uh, you can read that for yourself. Uh, we see uh, that, that, that John, he said, I saw a great white throne and him that sat upon it uh, and whose face of the earth and heaven fled away. And, and even though they fled away, there was found no place for them. 50 times, nearly 50 times, the word throne is used in the book of Revelation. And if you go through and you look at them, different thrones and different uh, contexts of different thrones, and when you come to this throne here, what you have, you have a throne of judgment. That's what this throne is. And he looks at this throne, and he says it's a great white throne. It's a great throne, and it is elevated. It is lifted up. It's a throne above other thrones, in other words. And he says it's a white throne, meaning it's a holy throne. It is a righteous throne. It is a pure throne. And he looks, and who's sitting upon that throne? God is sitting upon that throne. That's exactly who sits there. And he sits there in the personhood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he sits on that throne, and he's going to judge the people who have not been redeemed, the people who have not been saved, he's there uh, to judge them and they're there to hear what's going to happen to them. He sits on that throne and, and notice what he says, that this throne is so complete and so pure and so holy and so righteous that even the heaven and the atmospheric earth is going to be judged. And you can read that for yourself. I personally believe that it's going to be destroyed. It's going to be wiped out because the Bible says there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. But there at that judgment bar, there before the holy throne of Almighty God, John said, I saw the dead, the small and great stand before him. That's another picture of 100% of those who have not been redeemed will stand before that great white throne. And just like the heaven and the earth, there'll be no place for them to flee to, no place for them to run to. There'll be no place, absolutely no place to hide. It said the sea will give up its dead. And death and hell will deliver up the dead that's in them. And every man, every man will be judged. There'll be no more to run. There'll be no covering that uh, someone can put over them to hide themselves from the face of him that sits on that throne. Amen. Sobering thought to think about. It. Amen. I've thought about this down through the week. It's come in my head and in my, in my mind. And I thought about what it would be like to stand there. And it says they were judged by the things written in the books, the books that were open. And there's a lot of people who will argue about the moral and the civil laws uh, of the Bible. And, and certainly we hear people say uh, that no man can keep that. Those laws and those things don't apply to us. It applies to those people at those times. Uh, yet we can read through them and we can see that we have broken those laws. Uh, and, uh, and sin is the transgression of the law is what the Bible said. And instead of... Uh, of getting on their knees somewhere and asking God to forgive them and receiving Christ into their life and being sorry for their sin. People blow that off and they don't pay any attention. That we see it all over the United States today. People blow that off and they do not receive that and do not receive Christ. And what was it Jesus said? He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one to judge him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. If you make making notes, that's John chapter 12, verse 48. And, and from that, uh, from what Jesus said, from that word and the things written in those books that are open that day, they'll be judged one by one. And they'll be judged till it's all over with. And the Bible says there, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And that is the second death, and there is no escape from that. Absolutely no escape. I got to think about that. Been on my heart. So if it's like that, and I believe it's like that, because the Bible says it's like that, 
And I got to thinking about how horrible that would be and knowing all these things and knowing that the only way to avoid the great white throne, the only way to avoid that judgment, and the only way to avoid that second death, that permanent death, to be everlasting as separated from God and everything that's good, I got to thinking about that. I thought the only way out of that is to be saved or be delivered from it, brother Lon. Amen. I can't do it myself. I absolutely can't do it myself. I thought about that, and I thought about I would have to be saved, and I'd have to come out of that in order to, to avoid that. And I thought what I need is salvation. And I think about that word perfect. It's used over and over in the book of Hebrews. And consider what that punishment would be. Amen. 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 And consider the hopelessness of all that. Then I come to the conclusion I need salvation. And I just don't want, I want perfect salvation. Amen. 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 And perfect salvation comes from a perfect sacrifice. And that's what's talked about here Amen. in this 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews. Perfect used over and over and over in Hebrews. And it talks about a salvation. And considering the consequences of the gut, uh, 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 of the, the judgment, that's what I want. I want a salvation that's perfect. Amen. Nothing to worry about and nothing to stand in the way. I want somebody that can deliver me. So we re begin to read about these sacrifices. A, 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 a perfect sacrifice. And here in chapter 10, in the book of Hebrews, it talks about the law. And the sacrifices of that law, the ones pertaining to that law. And notice what it says in verse 1. Those sacrifices which they offered year by year. That means Yom Kippur. That means the tenth day of the seventh month. The most holy day in Judaism. In other words, we're talking about the day of atonement when the priest uh, went behind the veil in the tabernacle with blood to offer it upon the mercy seat uh, there uh, upon the ark. And that was the most holy day that there was. And I thought about what it said there. It says that that blood uh, that they used, that sacrifice that they took in there, it says those sacrifices can never make the comers there unto perfect. Those were not a perfect sacrifice. I know and I understand that those sacrifices, uh, they were offered up in the prescribed manner of Almighty God. And those sacrifices were picked in the prescribed manner of Almighty God. As God told Moses, uh, those uh, sacrifices, Brother Lonnie, they were without spot, they were without blemish, they had no disease on the outside of them, and they were filleted or they were skinned to say uh, that they were checked, all their innards were checked, that there was no disease on the inside of them. Uh, they took them to the prescribed place, uh, killed them in the prescribed manner, uh, they cut them up the way that God said to cut them up, they put them upon the altar and burnt them the way uh, that God said for them to be burnt. Uh, he took the blood uh, of the sacrifice uh, the first of the blood of the bull went behind there for his own sin. He come back out. He took the blood of the goat in there uh, for the sins of Israel. He done everything exactly the way that God uh, prescribed for him to do that. But those sacrifices was not perfect. If they had been perfect, they wouldn't have been offered year by year. In, in other words, every year it had to be done because in those sacrifices there is a remembrance of sin. Amen. Amen. So that sacrifice wasn't perfect. Amen. The sacrifices under the law could not provide for us a perfect salvation because the sacrifice of animals, it says there in verse 4, for it is not possible. I thought about that. It is not possible. Yet we read people are trying to get to heaven everywhere in the world. We read of people trying to get their sins forgiven every way in the world. Right. And we read about purification. That people want to be purified and they look at every way in the world to be purified. In Israel, we're looking for the red heifer. The perfect red heifer, by the way. It just can't be a red cow. It's got to be genetically perfect. And they've looked for this and looked for this. They've bred animals. They've looked up here and they've looked there and they've not come up with it yet. But the reason they need that red heifer, uh, Brother Lonnie, it's got to be sacrificed in the prescribed manner. 
It's going to be burnt upon the altar, uh, which they don't have yet. It's going to be burnt in the prescribed manner. You can read about this. I believe it's in the book of Leviticus. <laughs> but you can read about it. Uh, and once that uh, animal is burnt, those ashes are taken outside the camp, outside the gate, they call it. Uh, I don't know how that will be there in Jerusalem, but that is the plan, uh, to take those ashes out of there. And when somebody needs purified, that they can uh, approach uh, the, the tabernacle or the temple which will have to be built. The third temple will have to be built. In order for them to, for, uh, to go there, for unclean, they'll run water through those ashes of that red heifer and they will be sprinkled with that water. The same with the instruments. Everything that goes into that temple has to be cleansed, has to be purified. And they're looking for the red heifer to do that. And the, what the bum fuzzles me uh, when I read through the book of, 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 of Hebrews, I come to find out all that stuff has been taken away. So they do it for naught. Amen. Because hey. those things are not perfect. In fact, I believe they're just a shadow a foretelling of things, of better things it says are to come. You have to think about that. Better things to come. Amen. Those sacrifices weren't perfect. I'd hate to think I had to go through all that ritual and all that in order to have my sins taken away. And they would just be taken away for a little while. They would always be a remembrance of that sin in me. And I would not be completely purged from my sin because it says there that if it would purge, if those that come, that these uh, uh, worshipers once purged, that they would have no more conscience of sin or the sacrifice would not have to take place again. But in Christ, we have the perfect sacrifice. And that sacrifice has never got to be uh, uh, presented again. It's a once and for all uh, uh, sacrifice. For it's not possible, he said, that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. It can't happen. That's why Jesus came. He came, he came to do once and for all what we needed done. He done the will of Almighty God that our sins would be taken away, that we could be united with the Father. And that's what he come for. Amen. Notice it says there in verse 9. When, when I talk about this, and I want to get this out of context, when I talk about the old way of sacrifice and the new sacrifice, the old way and the new way, and listen, it's laid out there for us to understand it, and a lot of people read those verses of Scripture, and sometimes they seem like they're repeating themselves, or they're talking about the, the first and the second, and talking about, and some people have a hard time understanding it. He's talking about the old system, the old economy of the law, the sacrifices in the law, and the new economy, the new covenant which is in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. So thinking about that, notice what happens. Those, those sacrifices, like I said, those offerings were only temporary. Uh, he says there in verse 5, notice what he says when he come. He said, a body was prepared. Uh, you have prepared me a body. Or in other words, uh, you ha has fitted me a body is why that's written in the Greek if you want to read it that way. And it says the sacrifice came as it was written, verse 7, in the volume of the book. And the sacrifice is named by John the Baptist. What was it John said? He said, behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Hallelujah. And who was he looking at when he made that statement? He was looking at the Lord Jesus Christ, was he not? So we see that he is the sacrifice. He is the Lamb of God. And through his suffering and through his death, he would take away the first and establish the second. Amen. That is salvation. Amen. He said, I come to do thy will. He comes to do the will of the Father. And it says there in verse 10, by which will, notice that, by which will, look at those first four words, by which will, he's talking about the will of the, of Almighty God. He comes to do the will of God. And, and by his will, he says, we are sanctified. What was his will? That we'd be sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Hallelujah. That's where I stand today. I stand upon the rock. To stand upon the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I believe his sacrifice was once and for all, and I believe it was totally sufficient for every sin in my life. Amen. I believe he washed me, he cleansed me. I don't need no other sacrifice. I don't need no other days. I don't need none of this other stuff. What I need is Christ in my life. He is the one who saved me. It was his sacrifice that done away with all that that I read over in the Old Testament and all the things that we read through and all the things that we worry about. Listen, yes, we're guilty. Everyone's guilty. 100% for all have sinned and come short of his glory. We missed the mark. We didn't do what we're supposed to do. We did the things that we shouldn't have done. And because of that, because of the transgression of God's law, we stand guilty. But all that law was handled on Calvary, hallelujah, by the Lord Jesus Christ. And he took all that away and established the second. And the second is salvation. It was the perfect sacrifice. And it was the perfect salvation. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want. I don't want no substitute. Don't want nothing to play second fiddle about. Amen. I want exactly what Jesus Christ offers. And that's what he offers. Amen. I was thinking about Roger on Thursday night. 145th Psalm. He said, I made a note. I don't know where about you was at during that time, but I made a note on this piece of paper here. In fact, I made a lot of notes about what you said. I may preach some of it. Amen. Amen. But I got to read that, and I made this note here. It says, read this psalm and learn how to praise God and build a relationship with him. Yeah. That's what he said. May, that may have been your exact words. I, I know I wrote them down there. And I got through studying this morning. And I looked at that note. It was laying there. I had to lay it beside my chair there. Uh, where, uh, people think that you, you don't pay attention. you got another preacher. you got another teacher. you got somebody else comes to your church. A lot of times you think the pastor don't pay any attention to that whatsoever. I like to soak it in. Amen. I kept it there beside my chair. I looked at it every once in a while as I was studying this book of Hebrews. And I thought about that mode of mine. And I thought about the only way to have that relationship with him is through Christ. Amen. That's the only way we can approach the throne. Amen. That's the only way that we can come before him. Why? Because there's no righteousness in us. Absolutely not. There's nothing in us that, that he would desire as a sacrifice for anything about us. And we've got no way to approach him except through Christ. Why, man? He's the perfect sacrifice. Yes, sir, man. He's the perfect sacrifice. Sure, man. Man. That's what I want this morning. How about you? Have you got that settled in your mind? It ought to be a lot of times that takes away from our joy. David said, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. And brother, let me tell you, when you got your hope, you got doubts, you got fears, because you're trusting in anything else, that's the way it'll be, and that's the way it'll be when you go out of this place. You'll be worried right on down to the time that you shut your eyes. But when it's settled in your heart that it's the Lord Jesus Christ, He's the one, He is the one, He is the second, He established the second so that we can have salvation. And it would be a perfect salvation. When it comes down to that, yeah. let me tell you something. You'll have the confidence, amen. Mm -hmm. I don't have any confidence in myself. don't have no confidence in other things when it comes to my soul. All my hopes, all my dreams is tied up in a man named Jesus, the Lamb of God, to take it away sin of the world. Those of you watching my video, let me ask you, where's your hope at today? Where's your hope for eternity today? It's appointed unto you to die. You're going to go out of this world. That's just the way that it is. You're not going to stay here. And like the old preacher told that cop, he said, after this, the judgment. We need to consider that judgment. And when you consider the severity of the great white throne judgment and the punishment that comes with that standing there before a holy and a righteous God, and you consider the punishment that's going to be laid upon you, it's very important. Salvation is. And I hope you know him today. I hope you know the perfect one. Amen.
There's only one that walked perfect here in this old world, sinless, uh, kept the law of, of God perfectly, kept the things and done the things that we couldn't do uh, for us, praise God, and he died for us, and his blood was shed. It's not possible that anything else can take away your sin. It'll be the Lord Jesus Christ. Hope you know him today. If you don't, you need to get to know him. If you need help with that, phone number's at the top of the page as always. Give me a call. Be glad to talk to you about this. And the next time, until the next time, until the next time that we meet, be blessed.